I met Sadhguru really through happenstance uh, a few years ago. I was walking my dog down the street and I ran into Craig Johnson, who's my neighbor. He was walking his dog and he stopped me and said, oh, I just came back from this amazing retreat and you have to do this retreat. And I'm like, yeah, 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 L let me continue to walk my dog. He said, no, you have to go to this retreat. And he described to me the retreat and he described to me Sadhguru. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm kind of open for anything, so let's talk about it another time. And then a few weeks later, it just so happened that Sadhguru was in town and he invited me over to their house for dinner. He and Nikki, where's Nikki? There's Nikki right there. Many of you guys may know Nikki as the founder of the Spirit House in Woodside. She puts on some amazing programs. Uh, please look into them. So Nikki and CJ had uh, my wife and I over for dinner. We got to know Sadhguru a little bit and I found his perspectives very provocative, very different and uh, kind of worthwhile to step back and think about him a little bit. I then uh, accepted an invitation to go to a three-day retreat that he held and again I found it to be really interesting um, and made me think about a lot of new things. So we've been striking up a friendship over the last few years and uh, he's now out with a new book. The book is here and it's called Inner Engineering, A Yogi's Guide to Joy. And there's actually a bunch of copies that the publisher, Random House, has um, donated outside. If you want to grab one, please feel free to do that, where he talks about some of his perspectives on inner engineering, a way to uh, have better control over your your mind, your body, your energy, your emotions. So the objective tonight is really just to have a conversation about the challenges and the things that our, our kids, our teenagers are facing. I have three teenagers, most of you guys have uh, many teenagers, and uh, let's talk about that. I've got a handful of questions that I can pose to Sadhguru and he'll have interesting perspectives on those, but then I really wanna get you guys involved to have you guys ask questions and start a dialogue. One of the things that uh, someone that we actually met a couple weeks ago, the uh, Dean of Harvard Business School said to me, we were talking about leadership and he was sharing his philosophy about leadership um, as the Dean of a major business school. And he sort of said, it's, for me it's about knowing, acting, being having some real knowledge and expertise to lead, taking action upon it, and then living every day that way. And one of the things that I think has been the most amazing about Sadhguru's journey is the actions that he has taken. You saw some of the programs up there, but maybe you can describe some of the things that you have going on in the world, because it's not just about coming and talking and meeting, um, and philosophizing, it's actually about taking action. So maybe you can tell us some of the things that you have going on around the world and how you get them resourced. Good evening, everyone. This knowing, acting, and then being. When we say being, we're talking about the fundamental nature of our existence. The quality of our existence will determine the quality of our perception and the quality of our perception will determine the quality of what we know and what we do not know. Action is a consequence of this. If you put it upside down, then it's like saying fruit, tree, root, soil. That's not how it works. Soil, root, tree and then fruit. <laughs> if you put it upside down, you may pull out something forcefully, but the damage is there. Today, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working with a whole lot of business uh, leaders in the world, both in India and outside. I wouldn't like to generalize this, but I would say at least sixty to seventy percent of them, by the time they're forty-five, they're seriously damaged in many ways. Either they have become emotionally stifled 
because of their… a certain type of activity or many of them are suffering from various types of physical ailments, which is essentially they believe is a natural consequence of the kind of job they're doing. Because you're doing things forcefully. If you do not understand the natural order of things as to how life blossoms, if you want the fruit fast before the tree, obviously <laughs> it involves forceful ways of doing things. When you do forceful ways of doing things, one thing may be achieved but the rest is damaged. Most affluent societies in the world, everywhere, not just here, are going through this. They have become affluent, but the idea, the fundamental idea of seeking affluence, either in individual life or in a society or in a nation, is because it will give us a choice fundamentally of nourishment and lifestyles. This is the reason why human beings seek affluence, so that it'll give us a whole choice of nourishment and lifestyles. Now, if you look at people's lives, these choices are not something that they're enjoying. These choices are just freaking them out <laughs> People don't know what to eat, people don't know what to do, because we have not handled the most fundamental. We… we want to be on the racetrack, but we don't want to build a machine for it, we just want to win. Nobody wins a race because they desire it. Who doesn't desire victory? <laughs> Everybody does. But only competence wins in the end. So whether it's in a school or in a college or in a professional atmosphere, instead of tweaking our competence, we are tweaking our desire, which we call as ambition or goal-orientedness or whatever. You're tweaking your desire without tweaking your competence or you may be tweaking your competence but it's coming behind the desire. No, you must just tweak your competence. What you can do may be beyond your desire or it may be little less than that, we don't know. But without tweaking your competence, you're trying to tweak your desire which causes an unnecessary sense of stress when you do well. <laughs> Look at the pain of that. You're… you're suffering your well-being. This cannot be excused <laughs> because our well-being is coming at a great loss and pain to every other creature on the planet and we are suffering it simply because we are putting the cart before the horse. So, you cannot do being in the end, knowing Doing, knowing and being, no, no, being first, how to be. If you don't know how to be, wherever we put you, you will suffer. If you know how to be, whether you work here in San Francisco or you have to work in the Mars, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are, you will know how to do. What will you do? You will function to the best of your intelligence and capability. That's all you can do. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, it's not an issue. But if we do not do what we can do, we're a disastrous life. That's all we're trying to avoid, that we don't end up not being able to do what we can do. But once you create this unnecessary, completely avoidable stress that your desire is bigger than your competence. Without tweaking the competence, instead of focusing everything and tweaking the competence, we are tweaking the desire. Now you're creating a situation where there is stress. Stress means you're moving towards incompetence, not towards competence. Any machine on the planet will function at its best only when there is no sense of friction. The least amount of friction means that machine is the most efficient machine. Why is that not true for human mechanism? If this functions with least amount of friction, this will function at its best. Will I be as good as you? Maybe not. But I will be at my peak and that's all. 
and every human being has come with a certain genius. But I would say, because of the type of schooling that we have taken to in our… Eh, across the world, not in any one place, and the way we are approaching life, I would say ninety-five percent of the people live and die without ever realizing what is their unique genius. Only two to five percent of the people realize the genius of what they are capable of. Rest will all do something that somebody else is doing, they want to do that. They want to do that better than them. That is their idea of well-being. Because of this, a tremendous amount of human genius is simply lost. And that is the biggest crime on the planet, that human genius is stifled because everybody is trying to be in one basket and be on top of everybody else. This is a very rudimentary way of functioning in the world. Unfortunately, that's become the way everywhere. We're trying to do something but that's in small scale. The large-scale schooling and education and professional seekings are all in this way. We all wanted to get into one basket and be on top of the bas pile. It's a cruel way to live. If you get there also, you will suffer. If you don't get there also, you will suffer. Well, we're going right into the issues for children, for teenagers, and we're here with uh, two headmasters of two great schools. Describe to us some of the different philosophies that you use uh, and that your teachers use in the school that, that you have for children in South India and what we can learn from those approaches relative to the Western approaches? See, people are different segments of people put their children into school for different reasons. So I set up three different systems of schooling. One I think was a little bit was there on this video, which is rural schooling. Here the issue is, these are impoverished societies. Children are trapped in a situation where unless they get education, which is English-based and they have some technological capabilities, they can't get out of that pit. They will be in the same place for always, their entire life. So this is essentially job-oriented kind of education. This is in rural areas, in remote places. We run these schools and we also adopt government schools in the rural areas and see how to improve them. We have another school called Isha Home School. This is for the affluent children. This runs in a hundred and twenty acre property, very spread out with ten thousand square miles of forest behind us. Because I think it's a crime to have children in rooms and rooms and rooms and within that they're doing. One of the most important thing for the growth of a child is that there must be exposure to nature, to elements. Because without a healthful body, there is no healthy mind. It cannot happen. Your brain is body, yes? Brain is body, isn't it? We are always referring to it as if it's something different. What happens here will definitely happen here, how will it not happen? So this is a, a unique sort of school where twenty children will live in a household along with two dedicated people and they grow up with them. Almost all the teaching happens in the house except for libraries, laboratories and playgrounds. Everything else is within the house, that's why it's called a home school, till they come to seventh standard. After that, they go to the high school within the premises. This school is run with a very close interaction with… we don't call them teachers, they're just volunteers who are there. Highly educated people, but none of them are trained to be teachers because we don't want them to bring systems of education. This is just to stimulate the child in such a way that he is longing to know. The incredible thing is, 
we set them up into that level of curiosity and wanting to learn, many times these six, seven-year-olds come and knock on teacher's doors at ten thirty, eleven in the night because they're doing some project and they can't sleep. They want to know this now, they want to open one particular book and see what is there in that book. We've made the teachers in such a way that even if it's ten thirty, eleven, they'll open the library and sit with them and what he wants to know. This is an… this is a, like a home-like atmosphere where for every four and a half children and on average, every four and a half children we have one adult. Here there are no st rigid rules but everything is managed without saying anything. For example, there is no holidays in the school. But we have decided in a month there are four to five days which is off academics, but children will never know which day it is. It just happens one day. <laughs> today they started singing, today becomes all music, tomorrow we were talking about something, so today they're going to the… F that day they're going to the forest, but they don't know which day is a break because we don't want this culture of thank God it's Friday. <laughs> if you don't enjoy learning, <laughs> then what's the point? See, for any human being, knowing something new, stimulation of one's mind and intellect, is one of the greatest joys. If that doesn't come into the child's life, he's waiting, when is the break? When I actually started this school, when I spoke to a group of volunteers, said, this is what we need to do. I spoke to them about six, seven hours and said, this is what we need to do. Then they all looked at me and said, Sadhguru, how do we know that we are fulfilling your vision? I said, see, the, the school is in four-month segments. So, after the four months are over, when children have to go home, if they're tearing up to go home, that means you're doing well. And when they come to school, if they come joy joyfully, for sure you're doing well. This is unbelievable, I don't think it happens in any other school. At least fifteen to twenty percent of the children come back to school when the vacation is on, come back to school at least a week, ten days, sometimes two to three weeks early because they want to be a part of setting up the school. Because they believe it's their school and they're part of it <laughs> and they want to be involved. And many of these students, we've made them into student teachers that weekly one class or two class… two one or two hours in a week, they take the subjects. What is taught to you, you may easily forget. But what you teach, you never forget, you know. And above all, there is a new sense of responsibility once you stand up there as a teacher and do it. There are rewards for it, they get more emailing, you know, internet time. Otherwise, one important thing which is very important for the children is, at eleven o'clock in the morning, uh, there is a juice break. Children will all drink juice outside. Teachers will sit in the staff room and have juice and they have some discussions going at that time for about half an hour. These children who take the responsibility of teaching, they get into the staff room, sit with the teachers and drink juice, which is a very big thing for them <laughs> They are like staff, they get treated like adults totally. So things like these incentives where there is an excitement about learning, and uh, normally what is twelve years, I made it thirteen years. In India it's ten plus two, that's a uh, schooling system. I made it ten plus three for the same… this thing. Initially people said, why should we spend one year extra? I said, it's up to you because we've invested so much in art, uh, sport, theatre, many other extracurricular activities. The moment they come to eleventh, twelfth, generally in India they get marks mad, they want to get marks because passing marks in India is ninety-eight <laughs> There are universities where children who got hundred out of hundred, they don't get admission. It's just crazy. So I said those who are marks mad can go elsewhere, but we want to consolidate all the talents that they've picked up, plus we're exposing them to leadership, management, various types of industry, and many other aspects of life which would not happen in school normally. So this school is run for the affluent children, this kind of schooling costs quite a lot. 
But the other type of school that we have is here there is no academics of any kind. Here the focus is just on building human body and human brain to its fullest. We have methodologies, traditional methodologies through which we do. Here they learn yoga, kalari. Kalari is the mother of all martial arts, which is an elaborate system of developing the body, a classical martial arts, classical Indian music, South Indian music, classical dance, Sanskrit language, where it has the widest range of sounds to be used. We use the sound in a very effective way to develop the neurological system in the child. A wide range of sounds, this is something that doesn't happen to English-speaking children. They must do other kinds of sounds because expressing or uttering the sounds does wonderful things to neurological system. You will see these children are so balanced means they're super balanced. If they sit like this cross-legged, they can simply sit like this for five, six hours unmoving. You will rarely see children like that. So these children go through twelve years. Once they enter, twelve years is compulsory because they are not going through other forms of education. We have workshops where they learn banking, accountancy, a little bit of mathematics and a little bit of engineering and science, but that's only for practical purposes. But essentially, this is focused towards building human body and human brain to its fullest capability. And we are putting them through certain kinds of uh, uh, evaluations to see whether this is happening to them or not. These are incredible children, till you see them you won't believe this, wha how these kids are. They are very extraordinary children, they are not qualified for anything. People ask me, how will they go to the university? They are not made for the university, they are made for the universe, because that's where you have to live. <laughs> so here in Silicon Valley, I think some of the things that we see with our children uh, and some of the things that we hopefully want to help them work on and improve on their own. Issues like fear of failure, even though they're incredibly bright, capable young children. Fear of letting their parents down. Um, defining success in very narrow ways. Peer pressure, conforming to the group. Always being on. What can we, how can we impart some, some perspectives both on the parents and, and the children to manage these issues and create more balance in their lives? One of the things you were remarking on is I think you, you noticed that particularly in, in Palo Alto, which is an incredibly uh, sophisticated city, the suicide rate is very, very high. Of all the terrible things that can happen to us, our children want to commit suicide. This is unacceptable. It's the worst thing that can happen in any society. But this is not just an American phenomenon, it's happening everywhere. In India, 9,600 children committed suicide last year below 18 years of age. Out of this, about 800 children are below 12 years of age. Our children want to commit suicide. There can't be anything worse happening in society, isn't it? Obviously, we're doing something fundamentally wrong because a child is a fresh life. A child is a manifestation of exuberance of life. But today you're seeing children are becoming like this because the fundamental reason for this is this is one thing you will see in our schools. Children are exuberant and joyful. This is most important for me <laughs> This is important for every human being, not just for children. We have become like this because we are exercising only one dimension of our intelligence, which is called the intellect. Intellect means your intellect is useful only if it is sharp. You agree with me? Hello? Yes. You are becoming so serious <laughs> I'm talking about exuberance <laughs> 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 
Your intellect is useful to you only if it's sharp. The nature of the intellect is such, anything you give it, give your intellect, I mean whatever you give to your intellect, the only way it can know something is by dissecting it. If you give this flower to a scientist, first thing he will do is he will pull it apart to see what is inside. If I want to know you, Janathan, should I pull you apart? Is there a way to know life, I'm asking? Because this is what the intellect can do. We are just banking on human intellect too much, we are too enamored by our own intellect. Intellect means it has to function logically. Once you're intellectually on, you cannot accept anything which is not logical, yes? Logic means there has to be two. Two were created by your intellect. What is one big life, we make it into two. Everything we go on divi dividing and we fragment the universe into millions of pieces in our mind and we store all these pieces and hope they will all fall together. They will never fall together because whatever falls, falls in the sharpness of your intellect and further slices. We… You, you're talking about being really smart. If you're really smart, you must know how to keep yourself well, isn't it? Hello? Yes. <laughs> I'm really spa smart but I'm screwed up, what is the point I'm saying <laughs> What is the point of this? If I am really smart, I must know how to keep myself in my best possible way. This has not happened because our education systems in their fundamental concept do not allow other dimensions of intelligence to function. We recognize in the yogic sciences, when we say human mind, in yoga we say there are sixteen parts to your mind. These sixteen parts can be categorized as fundamentally four parts. First is the intellect, which is called as the buddhi in the, the local languages. The next is called ahankara, the identity. Your intellect always functions around your identity. Whatever you identified with, your intellect functions around that. It may be your individuality, it may be your family, it may be your community, it may be your race, religion, nationality but it functions around that, you will live for it and you'll die for it. Whatever you identify with, that is what it will try to protect because intellect is essentially a survival tool. Without intellect, you cannot survive. Right now, we are using intellect as a way of acquiring knowledge. We are using intellect to enhance our life, it will not work like that. Intellect is a fantastic survival tool. If your intellect is sharp, you'll survive well, but survival will never satisfy a human being. And for these children who are in this kind of school, survival is not even an issue. So they don't know what the hell they're doing with themselves. Raising the bar of survival, that's all that's happening. We are going on raising the bar of survival. Though you're doing very well, your stomach is full, you're eating and sleeping well, you feel like you're being oppressed because you have raised the bar of survival to an unrealistic place. Survival is taken care of, isn't it? Hello? So you should never feel threatened about that. <laughs> it's only about doing something more, but that will not come through intellect because intellect will only think of survival because it is a survival tool. Now we are trying to put the world together with our intellect. This is like Intellect is like a knife, you are using a knife to stitch. You know, you will tear more and more. You will see the more intellectual people get, they look smarter in a society, but if you just look at them as a life, they're just stupid. They don't know simplest things of their life. They are smart compared to somebody else because they are able to do something that somebody cannot do. But how they are within themselves? They can't sit in one place peacefully. This means you obviously don't know how to handle your intelligence. <laughs> the only problem with most human beings is, people do not know how to handle their own intelligence. 
Well, they have exotic names for this. They call it stress, they call it anxiety, they call it depression and many varieties of depression and madness and whatever. But fundamentally, you don't know how to handle your own intelligence. If you do not know how to handle the most vital aspect of who you are, which is your intelligence, which sets you apart from every other creature on this planet, it's a disastrous life. How can this be a smart life, I'm asking? If you are smart, you know ha how to handle your vital assets. One of the greatest assets that we have as human beings is, we have a cerebral capability that no other creature has, but we have not taken charge of it. It works against us. This is because you have a car with four wheels, but you want to drive it on one wheel. It's very stressful. <laughs> it's bound to be stressful. The other dimensions are not used. The second is called the ankara, which is the identity. This is very important. How an identity is set up? I see in these cultures very strong identities about religion, about race, about nationality, and maybe a football club or a bas basketball club. <laughs> they are so strongly identified. Uh, this will not allow things to happen. One thing traditionally in India we set up is, which is unfortunately vanishing today because we have taken to English education. <laughs> traditionally, when a child has to start education, first alphabet he has to learn means, first he is told, your identification is with the entire cosmos. Aham Brahmasmi, he is taught, he is made to utter a mantra which means, I'm everything. <laughs> because education is seen as an empowerment, you should not empower a human being who has limited identifications. If you empower somebody with limited identity, he will cause damage to everybody else which… who are not in the ambit of that identity. This is what as nations we are doing. This is what as race and religion we are doing to each other, isn't it? Every day this is happening. When somebody else does it, it looks ugly. When we do it, we are justified because everybody has their own logic. I want… I mean, let me take an extreme example because I have a way of walking into trouble. <laughs> right now, one thing that bothers everybody is what is happening in the Middle East, this ISIS, whatever, okay? I mean, it's a… Uh, it is… most horrendous things are happening. But people who are perpetrating this believe they are doing the best thing. They are doing God's work and they believe it hundred percent. They are not crooked people, believe me. They believe it one hundred percent because a man who is willing to die for it, at least you must trust this, isn't it? Someone is willing to die for something means he must be genuine in what he carries within himself, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. Life is precious for every human being. He is willing to die for it means he absolutely believes it. All the only problem is limited identity. You have an identity of yours, others are not in that, so they must go. So like this, from a very early age, we are setting up identities which are narrow based on various things. This is a very important requirement if intelligence has to simply expand without limits. It is very, very important, children start with a limitless identity, that you are identified with everything in the universe. This is very important. Now this identity, if you want to use an analogy, your intellect is like a knife. The identity is the hand that holds it. The hand that holds decides whether a knife will make life or take life, isn't it? Knife does not decide. In the hands of a surgeon, it may save a life. In an irresponsible hand, it takes a life. Knife is not doing this. It is the hand that holds what kind of identity have you taken on. Accordingly, your intellect becomes a fruitful thing for everybody around you or it becomes a destructive process. Intellect is a useless instrument unless it's fed with some data. If there is no data, if you wipe out all your memory, Suddenly you look like a dumb person, though you have a sharp intellect. 
because intellect cannot function without data. So the third dimension of the mind is called as manas, which is a huge silo of memory. We identify eight different forms of memory. The first form of memory is called as elemental memory, atomic memory, evolutionary memory, sen a karmic memory, in that there are two varieties. One is a silo of memory, another is an active memory, which is called a sanchita and prarabdha. And sensory memory, inarticulate memory and articulate memory. What you're experiencing as conscious memory is the articulate memory. It is not even one percent of the memory that you carry. When I say not even one percent of the memory that you carry, you definitely do not remember how ten generations ago your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather looked like, but his nose is sitting on your face. <laughs> because your body remembers every bit of it. Yes or no? There is a genetic memory here which remembers. Similarly, there is an evolutionary memory, a tonic memory, everything. Everything from the beginning of creation to now in some way is there. That is why this body is able to take this form and retain this form. Essentially, every form and every particular specific activity that… What we are calling as genetics, what is passing on from one generation to another generation is just a certain module of memory, isn't it? Memory is a possibility and it is also a boundary. Memory means accumulated information. Today, in the technology world, memory does not mean here, it's uh, in the computer in so many places. <laughs> memory means accumulated information. Accumulated information means a limited possibility. So the fourth dimension of intelligence is referred to as chitta. This is… this is a dimension of intelligence unsullied by memory. There is not an iota of memory in this. This is the intelligence which is the basis of your making. That is today, if you… Uh, if you eat an apple, there is an intelligence here which turns you… turns an apple into a human being. If you eat a fish into this, it will turn into a human being because there is an intelligence here which can do this miraculous job. If a drop of this intelligence, if you touch your chitta, suddenly your experience of life will become an ever-expanding process. Suddenly your genius will flower in such a way, every human being might have touched this dimension of intelligence at some point or other unconsciously. But the important thing is your consciously able to bring forth, this must come into our children. If we are interested that the next generation should be way better than who we are, it's important that they touch a dimension of intelligence that we did not access. Otherwise, in many ways, we have not done what we are supposed to do because one of the fundamental purposes why we are here is the next generation should be able to do what we could not do. They must be able to do what didn't, we did not even dare to imagine. Not in terms of doing freaky things, but in terms of doing something well beyond our capacity to do things, isn't it? That can only happen if we touch this dimension of intelligence, otherwise intellect is a trap. Intellect is good for survival because it only goes from the accumulated memory, beyond that it cannot expand. Here and there, Every human being might have touched this dimension of intelligence, but are we creating a system through which we can constantly access this? That's a big question. Only then human genius will flower. Only then you will see education becomes an empowerment, not an enslavement to some kind of desire, not an… there's a beautiful thing. There was a gypsy man, he's calling his son. You fool, if you don't learn some magic and jugglery and do what I tell you, I'm going to put you into school, edu make you into an educated man, you will suffer with endless want <laughs> So as parents, how can we help? How can we help our teenage kids? I don't think you should try to help your children <laughs> You must help yourself because children don't listen to what you say 
Really? They don't. <laughs> Jake, where are you? <laughs> they, if, if they're listening, they become old when they're young. They should not listen, but they pay attention to who you are. If you do not transform your life, don't expect them to transform. They may get transformed by looking at somebody else, but not by looking at you. Unless you transform, it's very, very important. People think they can give sermons and change a child's life. That will not happen because they're paying attention to who you are. They're not listening to what you say. So if once a child comes into our lives, it's very important that we start straightening ourselves out. <laughs> very important. Because somebody is looking up to you. When somebody is looking up to you, once you have this privilege that somebody is looking up to you, you must conduct yourself in a certain way. This is something we must understand. No, no, I'm like this only but I want to fix my child. Uh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> I, want to I must uh, tell you something about this. I brought up my girl. From the age of four, four and a half months as an infant, she traveled with me alone in the car, okay? I'm a nomad. I'm driving all over the place in India. And she traveled with me, I just trapped her to the seat. I kept one hand here and simply drove across India <laughs> Every day I'm in a different home, people are wonderful to me but you know the child is always in different places. One problem with all the adults is, they are very interested in teaching everybody around, wants to teach a child something that's not worked in their life <laughs> When I say it's not worked in their life, when they were five, six years of age, how exuberant and joyful they were. Unfortunately, whatever they learned has made them like this. That means it's not worked. See, with age, physical agility may go. Your aliveness need not go, isn't it? Yes? Whether you are thirty or forty or fifty or eighty or hundred, your aliveness should not become less. If your aliveness is becoming less, it means you're committing suicide in installments. Maybe the next generation will want to go a little faster than you. <laughs> yes, because they're seeing… See, I want you to understand the child's eyes. He doesn't have the information that you have. Let us say, not even your teenage boys and girls, they may not even be looking at you <laughs> they, they have other interests. I'm saying one, two-year-old children, just out of infancy, they're looking at you, they grasp things that you don't imagine possible, believe me. They're grasping things about you that you have not imagined possible. Only thing is, they may not be having storing this in their articulate memory, that they can actually know that this is what it is, but they know it by experience. They are seeing Adults are committing suicide in installments, slowly they're becoming less and less alive, as if they're practicing to go to their grave, grave faces they're carrying everywhere. This must change. The best thing that you can do to your child is to create an exuberant, joyful, loving atmosphere. This is the soil that's needed for the child to grow, not your advice, not your everything. When I was… my child was growing up, I told everybody around, nobody teaches her anything. As a rule, nobody should teach her A, B, C, one, two, three, nothing, nothing. Just leave her alone. By the time she was eighteen months old, she could speak three languages fluently, okay? And she grew up like this, then she went to school. I thought of not sending her to school but I was too much of a nomad to carry her around as she grew up. I sent her to school. She was thirteen years of age, she was disturbed about something that happened in the school. She came to me and then she said, you're teaching everybody so many things, you're not telling me anything. I said, well, I am not given to teaching anything unsolicited. Okay, now you have come, <laughs> let's see. I said, this is all you have to know. No other teaching needed for you, this is all you need to know. Never look up to anybody. Never look down on anybody, that's all. There is no authority to look up to, 
there is nothing to look down upon. This is not simple, as simple as it sounds, because the moment you think this is great, you look up to it. The moment you think, ah, oh, this is nothing, you look down on it. No, you don't make the judgment, you simply look at everything just the way it is. If you see everything just the way it is, believe me, your children will navigate their life extremely well, because they're seeing everything just the way it is. But now everything is exaggerated, something is high, something is low, something is God, something is devil, something is that, something is this. No, just look at everything just the way it is. Effortlessly they will nav navigate, everybody has the intelligence to do this. Let's open it up to questions. Let's create a dialogue here. Questions? With your comment about ISIS, how do you think that? Time has come in the world, more human beings on this planet are beginning to think for themselves than ever before. We just have to push that further, that everybody thinks for himself. Not your scripture, not your guru, not your priest, not your pandit, you think for yourself. Once you think for yourself, questions will arise. Believe me, if you ask three intelligent questions, ninety percent of the scriptures on the planet will collapse. It is so. You may not dare to ask, maybe many of you, but your children will ask questions, you cannot stop them. They are going to ask questions which will bring heavens down. Heavens will collapse. The increase that you are seeing in consumption of alcohol, other kinds of hallucin hallucinogenic drugs and many other things, across the world is simply because in their minds heavens are collapsing, do you understand? This idea of going to heaven and all wonderful things are waiting there for you are collapsing in their mind. Here, right here they want to do things, so they're going for chemicals. So why are we not looking? What is it that causes human experience? Does human experience happen from within us or from outside of us? Sir? from within us or outside of us? Joy and misery happens within us, isn't it? Everything, whether pleasant experience, unpleasant experience can only be generated from within us. Why is it what is coming from within us is not happening the way you want it? What is coming from within you must happen the way you want it. This is because we have been given a most sophisticated machinery on the planet, which is the human mechanism. But we have not even bothered to read the user's manual. Simply, we want to conquer the world. The most important thing is, one should know how to handle this, isn't it? Your thought, your emotion, your body must be happening the way you want it, isn't it? It amazes me to see Thirty, forty, sixty years have gone by, still people don't know how to handle their thought and emotion. Nothing of that has been inculcated in the education. We are always trying to fix the action. We are not seeing how to be. Without bringing the essence of how to be, if we do actions, it is only by accident we succeed. When we succeed by accident, anxiety is natural. Now, fighting ISIS is not the thing, the problem is this. Right now, in so many ways, human beings are miserable within themselves. Somebody is say, telling someone that there is a fantastic place out there where everything is great. People are eager to, eager to go there, the way to go there is to take you with me, <laughs> okay? So you can't stop me because I'm eager to go. You can stop me, if I want to rob you and live here, you can stop me. But I want to die, you can't stop me, isn't it? This idea that everyone has their own unique genius is very powerful, but I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about discovering, appreciating that unique genius. See, we must understand this in many ways. Maybe in the United States of America, you remodeled it a little bit, your education systems. But essentially this 
is this form and this mode of education comes from a time of industrialization of this world. When industries developed, suddenly we needed a lot of people who could handle those things. So we saw human beings are only cogs in the larger machine. We did not see human beings as human beings, at least this education system doesn't see. We want to produce people who will fit into that big economic engine that's going on. Then you will only produce nuts and bolts. <laughs> if human genius flowers, your design may not work because human genius may function in so many ways not necessarily the way you want to fit them into some machine. If we want to make it happen to the entire world is… is still a dream, okay? But to at least your children it's possible because your children need not fight for survival by the time they're twenty, yes? That is the point of you striving to bring yourself to a certain level of economic well-being is to see that your children have a passage through this life in such a way they can do what really matters, not just doing some rubbish for survival, isn't it? When survival is in question, we will have to do whatever comes our way. When survival is not in question, we can do what we really want to do. That's what must happen. So, what can we do? One important thing that we can do is, there is substantial scientific and medical evidence to show you that if you can remain in a pleasant state of experience, let's say for twenty-four hours, without a moment of irritation, agitation, anxiety, anger, nothing, simply blissful for twenty-four hours, they say, your intelligence or your ability to exercise your intelligence can go up hundred percent in a day. How many people on this planet can say, at least one day happens to them without a moment of irritation? Unfortunately, very few. If one day is not happening the way you want it, this means sun… we are off the rails, isn't it? We are just off the track in so many ways. So this is something that we have to bring. What uh, we are referring to as inner engineering is just this. We have engineered the world, we have engineered the world, we have engineered the world. So much engineering, if we engineer it further, there may not be any world left. All this engineering we did, did in pursuit of human well-being, isn't it? Definitely it's brought us comforts and conveniences that nobody had ever imagined, no question about it, but it's not brought well-being because well-being will not happen unless we te unless we know how to turn inward, unless we bring this into our children's lives that there is a way to turn inward and take charge of the seat of experience within us, the source of experience within us to take charge of that and you create the experience of your life. If you created the experience of your life, would you make it pleasant or unpleasant? Hundred percent pleasant for yourself, isn't it? So if you are in a pleasant state of experience, this will blossom. It is the right ambience and atmosphere for this human being to blossom. Tell me, for yourself as a person, when your surroundings are pleasant, are you not at your best? Yes? If your interiority is in a pleasant state, you will be at really best. <laughs> this must happen from an early age, for this to happen, the adults must set an example, this is the way to be. Ah, there are many concerns in our lives, there are many things which are not happening the way we want it. The only thing that's not happening in anybody's life, the only problem that anybody has in their life is, life is not happening the way you think it should happen. I'm asking you, is your thought hundred percent in your control? When you don't even have control over th your thoughts, Aren't you glad life is not happening the way you think it should happen? <laughs> it's very, very important we take charge of the basis of our experience. This must come into the society as a whole. 
if it doesn't come into the society right now, at least it's, it must come into your family, it's very important. Once you take this responsibility, this tremendous responsibility of generating another life, fresh life, you must fix yourself. Yes, it's a great privilege and a responsibility that we have produced a new life, then we must know how to be because this is the soil in which they're growing. Sir. Yeah, hey, I'd like to uh, make a comment. I, my son attends the school and the very first time he came back from the school and he was at a tennis shop and uh, the, the tennis guy was fixing his racket and asked him what school he was at. He told him that he had a school. And he said, well, how do you like your school? And he said, I love them. And I never heard him say that he loved a school before. And this was in the early going of his tenure here as a sixth grader. And I just would like to uh, piggyback on your uh, goal for an exuberant educational experience. And I would hope that as a primary goal, we would take away from this session that children can love school, they can love school. And if we work together to provide an environment that uh, tickles them in all the different ways, including academic challenge, they can love school. And I would like to ask you, in our traditional Western educational system, maybe born from the industrial age, um, what practical changes have you seen instituted in your typical Western school or American school, or, because my experience is limited, what practical changes have you seen instituted <coughs> to try and create a different environment, an environment that is not in the dark ages. It is forward-looking. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, industrial age was a dark age. They were also thinking they are being very forward-looking, <laughs> producing uh, a kind of uh, an assembly line. So right now, the schooling systems we have across the world, are actually assembly lines. First standard means this many nuts and bolts are fixed, second standard means this many are fixed, third standard means this many are fixed. We, to some extent, we have done this, that age groups are mixed. Up to three years of bandwidth, they are together, which makes a lot of difference. This used to happen at homes when there were five, six siblings. There was an entire learning process happening, uh, which is not, uh, you know, can't be quantified like this, but just be being with your brothers and sisters of different age groups, it did a wonderful thing for the child coming up. But that's missing now, you already grouped up in your own way. It is a… every class is a nation by itself. <laughs> you must see the level of uh, barriers that come up in this. This is one aspect. Another aspect of this is to break this sense of being like an assembly line. It's important that one thing is parents are cultured, continuously cultured because they initially agree, slowly they get anxious, their neighbor's child notes some… knows some math that my child doesn't know <laughs> These things keep coming back to us. <laughs> oh, that child knows this, my child and my friend's child are in the same class in your school, but that child knows this, my child doesn't know this, how did this happen? Your child was in theater, your child was in an art class, that child was in a math class. Okay, <laughs> but it doesn't matter, that child knows something that my child doesn't know. 
he got some nuts on that my child didn't get on. <laughs> this unnecessary anxiety is there in parents as if if they don't know one lesson, life is gone. There is no such thing. So one thing is to cultivate the parents to a different level of maturity that the child is not some kind of a machine that can be fixed up and all of them will go at the same speed. They're… they're living beings. <laughs> Everybody does their own things in different ways. Creating an atmosphere like that in a school is difficult because there are certain prescriptions that maybe the law has fixed, maybe whatever the systems that you're following has fixed, you have to fulfill those things also. There is no perfect way of bring up, bringing up a child, let me tell you that, there is no perfect way. It is just that if we have the necessary love and commitment in our hearts, there are many things we can wait out, look for appropriate moments and make those impacts on the child. There may be one child who gets really on at the age of nine, but another may wait to be fifteen before they're on. It's perfectly fine. A rose bush flowers at six months, an oak tree flowers at twelve years. You want the oak tree also to flower at, in six months, then there's going to be destruction. You'll have only one kind of plant in the garden. You won't have many varieties. The world is beautiful because all of us are differently capable in so many different ways. And to nurture that in a school is not easy. Teachers' work becomes supremely difficult <laughs> So they have to create a very organic situation where there is an… a certain level of involvement and transaction between teachers and students. There is a trust between them that, uh, you know, it is the way the atmosphere which allows this flexibility. If we don't create the j atmosphere and ambience for that, there will be no flexibility. If we are doing… raising children, if it's a job, it will not work. It must be a life's commitment, then only it will work. That's why we don't take professional teachers, we take only full-time volunteers who come, well-educated people. But this is possible in a certain atmosphere, this is not possible as a large-scale you know, across the world or across the country as a possibility. So one thing we can do is bring some simple practices where a child learns to turn inward. The parents must go through it too, too, otherwise it will not work. If the parents are not doing it, there is no way a child will do it. In a fun way, if you bring dimensions through which they can access, other aspects of their life, other than intellectually looking and slicing the world into pieces, things would change. It is not the perfect way to do it, but there is really no perfect way to do it. There is no perfect parent anywhere on the planet. What yes. about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> that Close. happens after you have grown up, you say that. When you were growing up, you had a thousand things about her <laughs> You had a question, ma'am? Yes. Um, thank you. Appreciate being here. I have a couple things. You just spoke of little fun things to teach your children, um, fun ways that they can go inside. I, a couple years ago, I took a yoga teacher training, and I love the meditation part of it. And so for two years, I've been, you know, med getting up early, meditating, doing breath work, and it's been amazing. My mind is still very noisy <laughs> when I'm meditating, um, which is sometimes very frustrating because I think, oh, I've been doing it for a couple years, but I've also, um, well, anyway, I don't want to go that direction, but um, I've been trying to bring this practice, the breathing practice, meditation practice, to my children. <laughs> 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 and it's 
times it, it had been quite disastrous. <laughs> well, not disastrous, but it turns into giggles or it turns into, oh, mom. <laughs> you hear me also laughing. <laughs> Could you expound on what you just met a minute ago by mm -hmm. <laughs> things we could do? As I said earlier, children don't listen to you. <laughs> They're watching you. They're paying attention. And as you admitted, it's not worked for you. What's not worked for you? Why should she inherit? <laughs> If it works for you, you don't have to say a word about it. You don't have to say a word if you truly become meditative. First of all, let's understand this. This for you, not for the girl <laughs> Meditation is not an act that you get up in the morning and do. Meditation is a certain quality. You can become meditation, but you can't do meditation. If you cultivate your body, if you cultivate your mind, your emotion, your energy to a certain level of maturity, the fragrance of meditation is around you. If the fragrance of meditation is around you, wherever you go, your girl will follow. She'll have no choice. But now you're doing meditation, which is bad enough, but now you're talking meditation, <laughs> which will put up resistance and the more you insist, the further away from meditation she will go. And many parents who in insisted on certain things very strongly, those children will avoid those things their entire life. <laughs> Let it not happen that way because every human being should know the fragrance of being meditative. This does not mean everybody has to sit with their eyes closed, not necessary. Because it's a quality. This quality, if it is there with you, then life is beautiful. Everybody must know this. But does it mean to say everybody has to sit down like this or twist themselves or turn themselves in the form of yoga? Not necessary. So cultivating the body, it's just like growing flowers in your garden. You want flowers in your garden, you don't have to think flowers or talk flowers. You just have to think soil, manure, water, sunlight, which look like nothing like flowers. But if you take care of those things, flowers will happen as a consequence. So meditativeness is a consequence. This is the whole problem with a goal-oriented society. You want the fruit, not interested in the tree. Now our children are growing up thinking fruits come from a supermarket <laughs> Many have forgotten the fruits come from trees. <laughs> they think it comes from the marketplace. Because we have become goal-oriented. In yoga we say like this, if you become goal-oriented, this means your one eye is on the goal. If your one eye is on the goal, you have only one eye to find your way, it's very inefficient. If you use both your eyes to find your way, depending upon how much strength you have, that far you will go. This has to shift. This is why I'm saying we're tweaking the desire. What should be at the end of my life, we're already desiring. But all our desires are an exaggeration of what we already know. There is nothing new in our desires, isn't it so? Only things that we already know here are exaggerated there, isn't it? Because the very nature of desire is such, it is only an exaggeration of what you already know. That means nothing new is possible by desiring. But if you enhance your competence, we don't know what they will do tomorrow. Neither they should know nor we should know what they will do tomorrow. But if you enhance your competence, something will happen which we have not imagined possible. Yes, sir. Um, but we still have a long way to go. 
of such as cancer. So I want to understand from your perspective spiritually, what causes the human disease and how do we prevent that? There are two kinds of ailments or diseases that happen to human beings. One are infectious, another are chronic. Infectious diseases are an invasion by another organism upon us. So if invasion happens, what to do? You got to fight it. Normally, we are taking to chemical warfare. We call this pharmaceuticals. But it's ex actually chemical warfare on the invaders who have entered our body, isn't it? That's fine. In many ways, we have contained infectious diseases in a phenomenal way in the last fifty, sixty or hundred years' time. All those terrible uh, epidemics that used to happen are gone, where millions of people used to die at once, you know. A plague or a malaria or a cholera that came would take millions at once. We have contained them largely, which is one basic uh, ingredient for the rise in population is we have contained epidemics big time. So that is infectious diseases, that is something a doctor must handle, that's the way it is. The rest are all self-help. That is, you generate the disease within yourself. The word disease means dis-ease, something is not at ease within you. If you create a mind which is not at ease, if you create emotions which are not at ease, above all, if you create fundamental energies within you which are not at ease, dis-ease is a natural consequence. There is some friction somewhere in the system. It is not simply happening effortlessly. When I'm saying effortlessly, because uh, <laughs> the best way is to put it upon myself. See, on an average for almost twenty-five to thirty years, on an average I've slept two and a half to three hours per day. These days I'm getting a little lazy and sleeping a little more, maybe four, four and a half hours. And I'm active twenty, day, twenty hours a day, seven days of the week. I don't know the meaning of a vacation because I'm just on all the time. But will I die of stress? No. Maybe sometimes I may die of exhaustion, <laughs> but not of stress for sure. If right now I've had my meal and come and I'm speaking, my pulse rate is going somewhere around fifty-eight, sixty. But if I sit quietly with an empty stomach, it'll drop below forty. This means this is going at total ease. In this, there will be no disease. Disease is happening because in some way we are cro causing friction to this. So there are many ways to approach it. There is a way of taking charge of the fundamental elements in the body, there is a way of geometrically aligning the system in such a way that there is no friction in the system or you can set a chemistry of pleasantness within you. Today that you're saying you're involved in medical research, you know modern medicine handles everything as chemistry, isn't it? Health and illness, both are a certain chemi… have a certain chemical basis to it. Joy and misery have a chemical basis to it. Peace and… Uh, uh, peace and turmoil have certain chemical basis to it. Every human experience has a certain chemical basis to it. Now, the, as there is a science and technology to fix the outside the way we want it, there is an entire science and technology as to how to fix your interiority. These subjective sciences have been completely neglected. It was… <laughs> there are many things coming to me like this, but recently this… Uh, we know the various medical research that is happening. What we've always known for thousands of years, a billion dollar research is done and now somebody comes to it. 
This is because we are not paying attention to life. If you want to pay attention to life, there is only one life you can truly know, that is this life. You have no way of what's happening there. Only way to know is what's happening here. If there are ways and means in our lives to pay attention to this one, not superficial mirror-like attention but an inter internal of, uh, attention that you are able to turn inward and pay attention to yourself, then you will see what's wrong and you will simply fix it because after all, the disease is caused by you. Today we know, recent research is saying that the cancer that you're talking about, which is taking so many lives today, is essentially your immune system not functioning the way it should. We must look at it, why are we destroying our in immune system? In the most affluent nation on the planet, you ask… you ask her, Jonathan's mother, when she was growing up, did any of… whether she or any of her friends had allergy to anything? Even then? They had allergies like today? Not like today. Today they have allergy to just about everything. People have allergy to sunlight. How do you live on this planet, I'm saying <laughs> Sunlight is the basic source of energy for us. People have allergy to sunlight. This is happening because we are not creating the kind of atmosphere that we need to nurture this life. One important thing that you need to do with your children is, till they become twenty-one years of age, Instead of taking them to Vegas, which seems to be fun, you must take them out into nature as much as possible, into the mountains, into the ocean, on the rivers, whatever this country has enough to offer. You must expose them to nature as much as possible, being in touch with the elements of nature. Very, very important. If you… we have a yogic hospital in southern India, one of the major treatments is, I make them work in the garden barefoot. You will see, <laughs> half their ailments will go just working in the garden. Work gets done and they get healthy <laughs> One last question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> let, and let me, and maybe this will be maybe a good wrap-up question. I want to take that question and, and blend it, which is, uh, I think, let's assume all of us are at some point but, but time, between the time of today and the time we're 60, 70, 80, 90, we will uh, make our journey in the way that you described. For the children, I think the thing that is most difficult for them is how to reconcile and how to balance all the things that you mentioned with their day-to-day -day need to, their desire and their feeling that they still need to compete to move to the next place. And in your response, perhaps bring in how they can create the right balance between continuing to move forward in their lives and get the grades that they need to get, whether they be A's or C's or B's or anything in the middle, and still accomplish the balance of joy uh, and a path that they can feel good about. See, to learn the alphabet, you spend a certain number of years. To learn to write and read sentences, you spend certain number of years. To learn a certain amount of math, you invest certain number of years. Why is it that we don't understand this? To learn the ways of how I function from within, there is no time for that. Why there is no time for that? Somewhere, we have set these priorities in the society that that's not important. We're talking about life. 
Today, somebody sends me a gift, just today morning I get it. And it's some… I think it must be very expensive, a spray, which is supposed to be good bacteria spray. I'm supposed to spray it on my face and my head and everything. So why do I need bacteria? I come from India <laughs> I didn't grow up in a laboratory. <laughs> I grew up on this planet where it's full of bacteria. But they say, no, 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 if you spray the bacteria, your skin will be healthy, you spray it on your head, your hair will be healthy. <laughs> I, I was just reading the literature, it's amazing <laughs> that you want bacteria. So what I'm telling you is, this life does not happen in exclusivity. This life happens in inclusivity. This is the what has caused this ecological disaster on the planet because we thought we could eliminate everything and we will live well. It doesn't work like that. It needs an ecosystem. So the same goes for your child, it needs an ecosystem. What kind of things are they exposed to? What are they doing with their lives? Where are we trying to drive them, first of all? Now, definitely what is it that an individual person at a certain age group do? We must understand a child, particularly a youth, means it is humanity in the making. Humanity in the making, 2017 model of Tesla should not look like the 2016 isn't it? We expect a higher level of performance, look different, feel different, everything different or no? If the car company goes on manufacturing the same model, will you buy it every year? No. Similarly, the next generation should not think, feel, act like how you are. That should not be the expectation. At the same time, are they working towards their well-being or not is definitely a concern for the parent, no question about that. So this will not depend on just fixing one child. We need an ecosystem because a child is not independent of the atmosphere that the child grows up in. Child is a part of the atmosphere, is a product of the atmosphere in which he or she grows up. So we have to cultivate the atmosphere. We want flowers, we have to maintain the atmosphere. We can't pull flowers out of the plant, it doesn't work like that. Then we'll end up with plastic flowers, yes. So what should the youth do? Like already she shared, she wants her child to meditate, which is the best of intentions, but it won't work. It'll be great if she does, but she won't do because she doesn't see any sense to it. I wouldn't do. When I am… A, when I am a youth, if my father tells me this, that, I won't do it. It has to make sense to me, otherwise I am… I am not going to do it. I never did anything that anybody said <laughs> and I keep telling people, I am a… I am sorry, I am a very wrong advice. But the only thing in my life that paid off for me was I never got influenced by anybody, either the family or the society or the religious atmosphere or the political… I did not allow anything to influence me. I just kept myself just the way creator made me. No influence of culture, religion, parentage, nothing. I kept myself little aloof from everything. And I saw slowly, there is a certain intelligence just to be alive. There is a certain intelligence. If this blossoms, I must… I must… Uh, this will be very encouraging for you because my father <laughs> who is a physician, in India at that time at least, now a different kind of madness has come, at that time the madness is why you see so many Indian doctors in America is, at that time <laughs> you also <laughs> At that time, education means you must become a doctor. If you don't get an entry into medical college, you must become an engineer. So either you see Indian engineers or doctors because the whole damn country is full of doctors and engineers. 
So my father being a physician, obviously he wants me to be a doctor. But of course, I <laughs> I was of a different kind. So Reese, about six, seven years ago, a bunch of doctors from America, about fifty of them traveling in India, without telling me, if they had told me, I would have told them not to go. Without telling me, they went to see my dad. He is ninety-four years of age. They went and asked, say something about Sadhguru's childhood, because he means everything to us, we want to know something about his childhood. My father thinks about it, says, he was such a dull boy <laughs> But now he's become a genius, I don't know how it happened <laughs> Obviously, most parents don't realize how to cultivate the genius of their children. They're trying to drive them in a direction. Don't drive. See, you can't get rose flowers out of this plant. Just because you like rose flowers, you can't pull rose flowers out of this one. This one will come out only with these little flowers, I don't know the name of this plant, but it's beautiful <laughs> So you should not be expecting rose flowers out of everything because you like rose flowers. The thing is, you have a new and fresh life in your home to cultivate it. We don't know what will come out of it. But for the children, it sounds like know thyself, think, think for thyself and follow your own path. See, I know you're trying to encapsulate that <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but you should not <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. You should not do that. It… this is why I tell people, to bear a child and raise a child, you must have either enormous courage or enormous wisdom. Yes, otherwise you must be just blind that it just happened. Because a new life is not an easy thing, it's not a small thing. A fresh life is not a small thing. If you see it as a phenomena, a phenomena which blossomed in your body, come out and it's growing, if you see it with wonder that it's a great phenomena, out of two cells, life is happening in front of you like this, taking shape. If you watch it with utter wonder and create an atmosphere, your child will grow into something beautiful, but may not be a rose flower that you expected. They need not become what you expect because your expectations are coming from the graveyard of the past. <coughs> they belong to the future. And children, I'm sorry, children are here for me to say this. Children don't belong to you. They don't come from you. They only come through you. It's a privilege that we must appreciate and enjoy rather than thinking it's a right or you determine where they should go and what they should do. No. As long as they are working towards their well-being, that they are not doing something negative against their own life, as long as that is not there, you must wait. You must… you must be for the entire… till the child becomes twenty-one, twenty-one, you must feel like you are still pregnant. Just wait. When the child was inside, you did nothing, right? Just nourished yourself well and waited just like that. Provide the atmosphere and wait. So our hope tonight was just to expose you to some of the things that we talked about. Um, as I said, for me, uh, there's been some provocative things that Sadhguru has introduced into my thinking, and hopefully we can take some of the things here and build them into our educational system. I know that both at Sacred Heart and at Menlo, there's a I lot of like really… I'd like to say one thing for the school. Yeah. Within the school, Something should be brought in, which is about the inner nature of the child. Please do this. I'm telling you, it will pay off in a big way. It cannot be done compulsorily, but they must be cultivated towards that, that every child spine spends a certain amount of time turning inward, because this will pay off in a huge way in development of the child, in the development of their intelligence and even their academics, I'm telling you. I… I must tell you this, when we first started this Isha homeschool, after three months after the school began, I went there 
for the morning assembly, all six, seven-year-old kids, they're all sitting like this. I said, why are they like broken tops? What's happened to them? And I just started a simple thing right there. Twelve minutes, just uttering certain sounds, seven notes of the musical system, just uttering them with a certain balance. Believe me, within a month's time, they're all sitting like this, straight and proper. Just uttering sounds for twelve minutes. Like this we can… we can… if you want, we can work with you and create a system that invests about twenty to thirty minutes a day for the inner well-being of the child. This will pay off in a big way on all levels of the child's development. Thanks everyone for your time tonight. <laughs>